this lesson looks at theories of forgetting and for your exam you need to know two different theories of forgetting interference and retrieval failure this lesson we will go through interference and then we will look at retrieval failure very soon so interference is our topic for today let's have a look at our starter so i want you to draw with a very brief description the multi-store model of memory doesn't matter whether it's very quick rough sketch that's fine just have a go without your notes see what you can remember so let's have a look at what it looks like so stimuli to the sensory register which is visual and sound iconic and echoic lasts for around half a second high capacity anything not paid attention to is forgotten Attention must be paid to get information from the sensory register to the short term memory, which is kept there by maintenance rehearsal. We know that the capacity is seven plus or minus two, so five to nine items. Duration, 18 or so seconds from Peterson and Peterson. And the coding is acoustic, as found by Badley. Anything that isn't rehearsed is forgotten from your short term memory. But elaborative rehearsal, which just means to add meaning to something, means memories transfer from your short term to your long term. Now long term memory is coded semantically found by Badley. Its capacity is very high but we can't test it and its duration is very long. And we can see that by Barrick's study using the um, yearbooks. And then anything is stored here is stored there forever uh, but we do lose some information and we presume that we lose it through decay. So have a little bit of a check Anything can be retrieved from your long term, from your short term, um, to speak about it and discuss it. But have a check of your diagram. Did you get that all right? Because we need to make sure we are fully confident with our models of memory. Now, as I said previously, we presume that the capacity of the long term memory is unlimited. So it's potentially a lifetime that all these memories last for. But we do know that we do tend to forget things. Some things might be difficult for us to remember. We might have to need a cue to get that out, like a photograph or somebody talking about a specific memory. But does it mean they are gone forever? There could just be a trace decay. So they're just fading slowly with age. And that is one generally accepted theory. However, we generally accept a popular alternative of interference or retrieval failure. So today's interference. So examples of interference would be how you change your password on your computer, but you keep on typing in your old one, even though you know you've changed it. Another one is your parents rearrange the cutlery drawer, but you keep going into the old section to pull out a fork. You swap your watch to the other arm to get rid of a tan line, but you keep looking at your left arm for the time. Or you learn a new lab experiment in psychology, but you use it for the wrong topic. For example, using milligram for conformity, when we all know that milligram is obedience. Make sure you do know that. These were all examples of interference where either new information has interfered with old, which makes us not be able to remember the old information, or the old information is interfering with the new information that we have learned. So there are different types of interference. There is quite a few things to it, but we will go through it, keep recapping it. So, interference general definition, one memory disturbs the ability to recall another. It might result in forgetting or distorting another memory or both of them, and it is more likely to happen if these memories are very similar. So that is your general definition for what interference means. But there are two different types. The first one is called proactive interference. And proactive interference is when previously learned information interferes with the new information you are trying to store. Now, the example I've used is if you have difficulty remembering or learning the names of students in your psychology class and instead you remember the names of the students in your class the year before. So that is the previous information that I have learned. So an old memory interfering with the new memory trying to remember a new class of names. The opposite is retroactive interference. So a new memory interferes with trying to remember an old one. So, for example, I might have difficulties remembering the names of the students in my class last year because I have learned all of your names this year. So that would be retroactive. So make sure that you have got those definitions down. 
You don't have to use that example. You could use an example that makes more sense to you. And that's absolutely fine. Make it more specific to you so you're more likely to be able to remember it. But there is also a way that I use to remember what which definition is which. But pause the video here. Make sure you've got your definitions down. Now, the way I remember it is P means is past and proactive is a past learning interfering with new. So P and P match. R, retroactive, a recent or new memory is interfering with old memory. That's how I remember it, matching the letters. P for proactive is a past interference. R for retroactive is a recent interference. Note that down if you think it'll help. If you, that confused you a little bit more, don't bother. That's just the way I remember it and the way I find it easiest to remember. So that's with everything. We need to have a little bit of a go. So pause the video, have a look at these scenarios, read through them, say whether it's proactive or retroactive and justify for me, please. Right then, let's have a look at the answers. So, Joseph is retroactive because his new mobile number is preventing him from remembering his old one. Michelle is proactive because her old knowledge of Spanish is interfering with her new ability to recall French. Ruth is retroactive because her new PIN number is interfering with her memory of an old one. And David is also retroactive because David's new memory of driving an automatic is interfering with his old memory of driving a manual. So make sure you got those right. If not, correct them. Have a look over the definitions again. Make sure you know why. And as with anything in psychology, we always have some studies. Now, this study or well, the first study of the three that we're going to do today is already put into your booklet for you. You just need to write a little bit around it. So the graph is already in there. And this is a study by Giach and MacDonald, 1931. Don't take my pronunciation for it. That's what I'm going for. And he studied or they studied interference in terms of similarity. Now, participants had to learn a list of 10 words until they were 100% accurate. They could recall all 10 they then had to learn a second list of words. There were six different types of lists that the participants would have been given, but the participants would only be given one, which makes it an independent group's design. And there were different types of words that they were given. Now, synonyms are words with the same meanings as the original. So the original might be things like huge, whereas the new one might also include things like gigantic. Antonyms are things with the opposite meanings. So if the first list was huge, massive, great, the second list might be tiny, minute, small, which they mean the opposite. And the findings are in the graph. So it was very difficult for participants to recall the new list if they were synonyms, so if they were similar to the original. But it was a lot easier if they were numbers or if they didn't have another list, which was a control. So interference is a lot stronger with the increased similarity of the words. And that is shown on this graph. So you just need to make sure that you write a little bit of description around there so you fully understand it. But this is a lab experiment. The second study that we are going to look at is by Burke and Scroll in 1988, and they presented a a series or a number of magazine adverts to the participants and they had to recall the details of what they had seen. So things like the brand names, details of what type of advert was it, did it include different people, how many people did it include, what were they advertising. In some cases they had more difficulty in recalling earlier adverts, in others they had problems remembering later, so that's showing the proactive and retroactive. This effect was greater when the adverts were very similar. So if the ads were for the same product, so two toothpaste adverts, but they were for different brands, it was difficult to remember those. And this is known as a competitive interference. Again, this is another lab study for us to write down. So make sure that you write it. It doesn't have to be word for word. Just write it in your own words, Burke and Squirrel, about the magazines. But as you should be well aware, 
lab experiments poses quite a few issues. They are good in terms of maintaining control, seeing a direct cause and effect relationship, but we have difficulty generalising these to real world settings. So we do have one more study that is more realistic. Obviously it's me. So we've got a rugby study and pictures down the side just show you the best winger in the world, Tommy Bakinson, who plays for the best team in the world, St Helens, obviously. So this study by Badley and Hitch should recognise those names. And what they did was they asked rugby players to recall the names of teams that they had recently played. Now, as a rugby player myself, um, there are various reasons why you may not play in some games. So there might be injuries, if you may, it's quite often an injury, or suspensions. And most of the players that they interviewed had missed some games. So for one player, their last game might have been last Saturday. For another player, it might have been two months ago. So I can tell you the last rugby game that I played was against a team on the Wivel. Now I'm going to pronounce this wrong, Aunt Salmian's team. That's who I did my shoulder against. Um, but I couldn't tell you who my team played against two weeks ago because I didn't play in it. And that's essentially the findings of Badley and Hitch. They found that recall for the last game of that player was equally good, whether that game was played, from, in my case, 18 months ago or last week. So it shows that incorrect recall was not due to decay, so it wasn't due to the amount of time, but it was related to the amount of games in between. So if I put it into more realistic terms, for me, I know that it was Aunt Salmians that I played against in January in 2019. That's when I dislocated my shoulder. That's the last rugby match I played properly. If you turn around to one of my other team members and said, who did you play in January 2019? They would have no idea, but they could recall last week or the week before. I couldn't. I didn't play in it. So it isn't the fact that it's the time. It is the amount of games you've played in between. So it demonstrates that interference is a real reason for forgetting in our everyday life, because this is a more realistic study. Now, we haven't forced people to play rugby. We haven't forced people to get injured or manipulated injuries and suspensions. So this makes it a natural experiment because these things are naturally occurring. We haven't manipulated anything. So this is a much better study in terms of generalizability. But can we actually generalise it to those who don't play rugby or contact sports? That might be an issue. So make sure you've got details down of this study. I, the McDonald and McGeoch study, you've got notes around that and you've got the Burke and Squirrel down. Thankfully, that's all the studies that we're going to put down. But we do need to have a little bit of a practice. So if you're in your booklet, you can type it in. If not, here is a question. Aaron was upset that as he left the Spanish exam, he regretted learning Spanish in year 10 as well as French, which he started in year 9. He felt like he was getting French and Spanish mixed up with the nerves of the situation as some of the words are very similar. He was annoyed that he said French words in the Spanish exam. Outline one explanation for forgetting. How might this explanation account for Aaron's poor performance in the Spanish exam? Now, it is four marks. Try and time yourself six minutes. See how far you get. But make sure you use information that has been given to you in this scenario. Don't just say interference is and leave it as that. You need to link back and be specific. So pause it here, time yourself six minutes, see how you get on. Now I've done you a little bit of a model answer. So one explanation for forgetting is interference. In this case, proactive interference is happening because it is past information that is causing confusion with recent in this case, Aaron started to learn French in year nine, a year before starting Spanish in year 10, and his Spanish, in his Spanish exam, Aaron was annoyed that he said French words in it. This shows that his previous knowledge of French has interfered with the more recent learning of Spanish. So that is a good link because it's using French, Spanish, year nine, year 10. There is a bit of an additional, it wouldn't be completely necessary, but just to add a little bit more. Furthermore, as it said that some of the words in both languages are very similar, this supports the findings of McGeoch and MacDonald that learning new words that are similarly, similar to previously learnt words causes more interference with the recent learning. So it's just a little bit more, definitely hits the four marks. Just make sure that you've got good link, good application in there and make any changes that you may need.
And now we also need to go on to some evaluation. So we have got two strengths, two weaknesses. First one, a strength of interference as an explanation of forgetting is that there is support from lab experiments. Now it's up to you which one you want to use. You can use McGeoch and McDonald or Burke and Scroll as your evidence, but don't just say this can be seen through McGeoch and McDonald. Explain what happened in that study. And in your comment, link to validity. So what type of validity might it include? What type of relationship can we see? Why is it a good thing that it's done in a lab? But I also want you to counter argue. What does doing it in a controlled setting reduce our ability to do? What type of validity does that reduce as well? So I want a sentence of counter argument in there, please. Pause the video whilst you write it. The second one, again, is a strength, but it's with a counter. Badly and Hitch conducted research in an everyday environment, meaning it is what? And overcomes the criticism of what? So what type of validity might lab experiments be low in? In your E, I've done a little bit of it for you, but it is just information on the study. So asking rugby players to name the teams they have played so far in a season. Accurate recall didn't depend on how long ago the matches took place, but how many games they have played in between. So more interference. This provides support for what? And then I want you to put in there how it is a positive, that is a natural, why is it that a good thing? But again, counter argue, what are the disadvantages of a natural experiment? What haven't we got? Which will increase what? So try and have a look at the gaps. They should help you out. You don't have to write it exactly word for word how that is, but just make sure that you have got a good thing about natural experiments is this, but a bad thing is this. Make sure it's a bit of a counter. Then we've got our two weaknesses. First one, artificial tasks and environment. So there is a greater chance of proving interference in labs due to the nature of the tasks being artificial. Often the material used for the tasks are words lists. They don't really reflect what we learn or forget in everyday life. So what do these tasks lack? You might put the McDonald and McGeoch study in there just to give a little bit more to it because they use lists as well. But what types of these lack? Remember, it's that word that's very similar to EcoVal, but it's not. And then what other weaknesses can be used to criticise these studies? Do they make it more or less useful for us? Is it a positive or a negative thing? You might counter argue with a positive. And then the last limitation, the time between learning. Now, some studies on interference have been criticised for the lack of time given between learning and recall, so may not be useful in helping us to understand interference. The key is that these tasks often require participants to learn a list and then recall it straight away, usually short amounts of time. This isn't what you would happen in everyday life. We don't recall information immediately after learning it or remembering it. There is a significant time lag. So linked to the fact that it's not realistic of everyday life, it's quite difficult to make the um, conditions very similar to everyday life. So the studies may exaggerate the influence of interference. And whilst it may be correct that interference does occur, it might not be as much of an effect as we think it is. That is the main point of this PEC. Now that is everything on interference. We've gone through quite a lot of studies there, three studies, three new definitions and some evaluations. I want you to have a look over your notes because we will need to do another theory of forgetting this week and we will need to do another lesson as well. So can you just make sure that you are fully comfortable, make sure that you ask any questions that you need to, email me no matter what it is, can you help me with this PC, can you re-explain this for me, I will help you as much as you can. But hopefully we're getting there, we're nearly at the end of the memory booklet and we're feeling okay about all the different parts of the memory topic. But keep on going, keep looking over your notes and speak to you soon.